19th century book published there. Uh, I want to begin with a quotation from Charles Dickens. Uh, now, Charles Dickens is generally thought of as a critic of capitalism. Uh, people would point him for hard times, for example, and in fact, it's a critique of industrialization. Uh, you really study it, you'll see Dickens was quite a capitalist himself. Uh, a small time entrepreneur to begin with, but a big time entrepreneur uh, for much of his life. He died an extremely wealthy man, a uh, multimillionaire uh, in our terms. Uh, uh, and capitalism is a good to Dickens, and he had a high regard for free enterprise, the great supporter of free trade, for example, in his journal Household World. Word. In 1853, uh, he was honored at a banquet in Birmingham. Uh, that's in the industrial midlands of England, Birmingham and Manchester, the center of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and he to say, in words that would make any true Marxist cringe, uh, he got up and proposed, proposed a toast to the city of Birmingham. Birmingham, the very heart of middle class England, the very heart of industrial England. To the great, compact minds of the people, by whose industry, perseverance, and intelligence, and their results in money wealth, such places as Birmingham and many other markets have arisen. To that great center of support, that comprehensive experience, and that beating heart, literature has turned happily from individual patrons. Sometimes munificent, munificent, often stolen, always few. And it's found there, there in the English middle class, its highest purpose, its natural range of action, and its best reward. Let's bring to the head. Charles Dickens, saluting the middle class virtues, industry, perseverance, and intelligence, and the result in money. <laughs> Which has now given literature proper support. I know he, he, he just he says, To hell with patrons. We are so relieved not to be dependent on patrons anymore. Because there were sometimes munificent, they were very generous, but they were often sordid and they were always few. Uh, uh, and so he's very few. You know, a writer who, again, most people would think of as anti capitalist, celebrating the triumph of capitalism. And the Industrial Revolution in English Midlands, uh, and saying artists finally have their proper source of support. And he goes on to say, Let a good book in these bad times be made accessible, even upon an extremely difficult subject, and my life upon it, it shall be extensively bought, read, and well considered. No complaints from Charles Dickens about the case of the English reading public. Uh, now you can say, now, yeah, it's all that was easy for you, Charles Dickens, to praise the case of the English reading public. They made you the most famous and well rewarded author in the history of the world. But that's, of course, very important. It shows that, in fact, the English readers did have faith. Uh, uh, here was the first mass commercial market for literature. And who emerged from it as the number one author? The number one author in quality. The one that to this day, you know, anybody would say was the greatest novelist that he was uh, probably ever in some of the 19th century. Uh, uh, so the dumb, mass reading public was pretty smart. And in fact, by and large, uh, the authors who were most successful are the ones we still read today, uh, and the ones who failed. As people go study those novels in dusty libraries, find out why they failed. They were generally speaking very bad authors. Uh, uh, and so, uh, if Shakespeare was exhibit A for me this week, Dickens would have been exhibit B. Uh, that is, uh, you know, the greatest playwright in English, the greatest novelist in English, operated in fully commercial environment. Uh, uh, and so there can't possibly be a simple antithesis between the world of commerce uh, and the world of high culture. It is very ironic that what today 
is regarded as high culture, Victorian novel, uh, you know, made into uh, television series on masterpiece theaters and of course society universities. That was the absolute heart of popular culture in 19th century England. So, uh, we're now uh, firmly within the 19th century, and that does mark a turning point in the week's romp through cultural history, because we're now, after the Industrial Revolution, we are in the world uh, of mass society and mass culture. Uh, and we're really getting to the heart of the argument today. Uh, that is, uh, uh, up to now, uh, you know, I've been trying to show the commercial basis of taking this through their uh, moving painting and that, that sort of thing, uh, but we haven't yet gotten really into the world of mass culture. Uh, we're now in the world of the commodity, the world of commodification, as my luster colleague would say. Dickens' novels are sold uh, in a hundred thousand ways. Uh, and that now you know we've got these mass produced commodities, mass parading of art, my Marxist critics would say, you know, just picture to yourself a hundred thousand copies of Oliver Twist lined up next to each other and you're here in here. Uh, mass production, uh, uh, uniform product and being marketed to a, a vast public. Now, the way I've tried to show that's not quite unique to the industrial world, that Rubens had a factory. And as I've been trying to show, artists desperately wish their work to be commodified. Uh, Rubens kept thinking, well, I can't paint as many paintings as the public will buy. What can I do? And so we created a painting factory. In effect, so we could turn out more Rubens. <laughs> by having people like Van Dyke uh, do them. Uh, talk about tapestry. And again, I say that the tapestry industry was a major industry in Flanders uh, during the Renaissance. Uh, it produced great works of art that hang in museums now. But it was extremely profitable and one of the central industries of that area. So I don't want to uh, uh, overstate the move we've made here, uh, in a way we've been looking, uh, looking at how artists have made a living by finding ways to commodify what they do. The notion of piece music, of writing a piece of music and then getting it printed and selling it to a market. Uh, and, you know, uh, Picasso, uh, as I was saying, there's no artist who has ever thought more eagerly to commodify <laughs> what, what to do. Uh, go to the lithograph market, go to the ceramic market, the print market, and so on. Uh, the whole history of print, uh, of the engravings and, and print the paintings, for example. Uh, but now we really, the numbers start to look real dark. You know, even movies turned out to be factory maybe thousands of paintings, but now we're going to be in the hundreds uh, of thousands. Uh, and, and this is where the Marxist critique Thing. Uh, uh, that the commercial base of culture is the debate uh, of culture. <laughs> but this debate culture is what produced these great Victorian novels, including the work uh, of Dickens, and so uh, how debate thing could it really be? What I'm going to try to show today, uh, this morning, is that uh, uh, Dickens, uh, as another great novelist of the era, uh, certainly had problems with the English publishing industry. Uh, and you can say they managed to be great in spite of it, which is enough to say. But I want to suggest further they managed to be great to talk of it, that there were aspects of the very commercialization of English publishing uh, in the 19th century uh, that uh, uh, actually improved the novel of people like Dickens. And above all, because it kept them in touch with their audience. And that's something I've been, that's sort of my underlying theme here, is that the commercialization of art, which was negative to so many critics and especially Marxists, is one way of keeping artists rooted in a living audience. And I think it gives their work more vitality uh, and more uh, a vibrancy. 
Uh, now, the other thing is the end of the 19th century, we just have a lot more information. Uh, and, and we really know much more about what was going on. We start to have surviving correspondence between authors and their publishers. We have statistics that are much more reliable. Uh, uh, we're very anecdotal up to now. Uh, <laughs> how much <laughs> is dead with most of when he died? How much money did uh, Bach have when he died? You know, now we start to have real records that stick in bank accounts and that sort of thing. So, so we can get a little more specific with things now. So let me begin uh, by describing uh, basically the publishing industry uh, in England in the 19th century, uh, uh, and then go on to show how it, it interacted with authors and authors interacted uh, with it. Uh, uh, publishing was a major industry uh, in the 19th century in London, uh, was became the world center for publication. Uh, it's still one of the great centers for publication uh, in the world. Uh, and it was very much uh, one of the great beneficiaries of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and again, we're looking at one of these situations where uh, capitalism made certain positive cultural developments possible. Uh, uh, I really recommend a book uh, called The English Common Leader by Richard Aldrich. I put it on the supplementary bibliography. Subtitled The Social History of the Mass Union Public, 1800 to 1900. And although Aldrich would never say this, uh, he tells the great story of the science of capitalism in his book. He shows that capitalism made possible and even worked to create the mass reading public. Uh, and I'll give some specific examples from his book uh, in a minute. Uh, but just some of the technological changes uh, that made it possible for a mass reading public. Uh, one thing uh, was uh, a vast reduction uh, continuing throughout the century in the price of paper. Here's one of the incredible side effects, benefits of that horrible industrial revolution we're always being taught, uh, ruling things. Uh, the, uh, the textile industry, which was one of the great industries that grew up in England in the 19th century, and uh, it was dominated the textile industry for much of the 19th century, resulted in the uh, uh, proliferation of rags both in the manufacture of textiles and in the recycling of them. And uh, you suddenly had a tremendous surplus of rags, and one of the great uses of rags then was to make paper. Rag content paper. Uh, it actually was the purity for the paper we see today, and was acid free. Uh, anyway, there was suddenly it became much cheaper to make paper so we could make it out of surplus rags. Uh, now, they're asking that positive tendency was the government taxes on paper. It's extremely high, uh, relatively speaking. You know, it's the kind of thing that the American Revolution happened over, like the Stamp Act. Uh, the uh, uh, British government thought that taxing paper was a great source of income, and they didn't mind that it made publishing more expensive and books and, above all, newspapers more expensive. But they were just as happy not to see the development of the newspaper industry. These newspapers were critical of the government. Uh, so there was a huge battle in the course of the 19th century over the taxes on paper, which were in fact called taxes on knowledge. Uh, and from now on, I'll be, I'll be talking about ways in which the market uh, has helped culture flourish. I'll also keep mentioning ways in which government intervention in the market has impeded the development of culture. Uh, uh, and, you know, basically my advice to people who want government support of art, art would be this. And it's an old French line, let them say it. Just leave the market alone. Stop interfering in it. That's the best thing you can do for encouraging culture. And this is one of the examples. Uh, and the liberals in England in the 19th century were very hard to get these various taxes on knowledge uh, eliminated. Uh, uh, so paper became cheaper. Uh, uh, the introduction of steam engines into printing was a huge development. Uh, uh, it speeded up the process of uh, uh, printing exponentially and made possible large-scale printing. Uh, just looking at all this, I think he says that 
Uh, the average print run for a novel in the 18th century was 750 copies total. Kind of amazing. I've sold more copies of my books than that. Uh, uh, the huge run of Dickens novels, uh, eventually in the hundreds of thousands, that required uh, a new technology and capitalism and rolls to read the deed. Uh, and uh, later in the century, uh, 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 linotype printing was developed and uh, 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 stereotype printing. There is, uh, at the beginning of the century, uh, there was essentially a type shortage uh, in England. Uh, you couldn't set a whole book at once. You had a, uh, just some individual pieces of type and they had to set a couple of pages, put them, go back and reset the type. Uh, uh, that was a tremendous drag on publishing uh, and even on the proofread reading of uh, a, a novel. Uh, and so in the course of the century, uh, all sorts of development uh, made it easier to set type. Uh, and by the end of the century, they had automatic uh, type setting. Uh, so all of these things which capitalism made possible, which were driven by the capitalist desire to reduce cost uh, and suddenly increase volume in order to reduce cost uh, per, per item. Uh, uh, so on the production end, there were all sorts of ways uh, in which uh, a, uh, uh, the success of the novelist of a chicken would not have been possible uh, without the technological development. On the other hand, and this is where an Austrian economic perspective is important, these technological developments were driven by the prospect of people like Dickens. Uh, publishers wouldn't uh, have worked so hard with printers to increase their capacity if they didn't see that they could sell these large numbers of books. And it was above all Dickens who opened up this possibility when they saw how many copies uh, his books were selling. They said, we've got to find ways to print faster, and we've got to find ways to reduce the cost of paper. Uh, so again, Marxists are always production-driven in their thinking. Uh, and when they talk about these developments, they say, oh, well, where there are these independent developments in technology, and they then uh, govern uh, the writing of novels. But we know that the economy is customer-driven and demand-driven. Uh, 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 you know, that Kevin Costner, the Costner film, Field of Dreams, remember the great slogan that if you build it, they will come? That's Marxism. Capitalism is if they will come, you will build it. And we know that that's the truth. That's uh, the economy that we get anticipate the demand and respond with production methods. So it's really Marcus that he said, if you build this table top, yeah, if you create these great uh, steam, high-speed steam presses, then they'll buy them out. Well, it's because you think there's a market, vast market for these novels that you develop into uh, a technology. Uh, now, in a related way, marketing a book, uh, went through incredible developments. And one thing I'm going to try to show you is that the book industry is much more modern than we think. Uh, and that uh, uh, its marketing methods uh, were very sophisticated, and you're going to recognize them and see that much of what we think is a 20th century development is really already there in the 19th century. And again, uh, the market for the Frankfurt School, you know, complain about mass markets and mass marketing and how uh, uh, films really don't have any here in value. It's just the way they're marketing, marketed in the same television program. Well, we're going to see if that's true, then Dickens novels have no value and they were just marketed as well. So, for example, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the marketing of Dickens novels were really quite extraordinary. They had all sorts of tie-in products and the equivalent of Dickens action figures. Uh, and part of the way they made money was you sell all this stuff uh, in conjunction with a Dickens novel. Let me read you something from uh, one of my colleagues at the Dean, Jennifer Wick's book, Advertising Fiction, Literature, Advertisement, and Social Reading. Uh, 
This is first new success with the pickle paper. Absolutely unprecedented. Uh, uh, it started selling 40,000 copies. No one had ever seen anything like that before, except for the Bible. Uh, uh, and so uh, they capitalized on this. They decided, uh, let's start selling a little figurines. After the publication of Pickwick, Weller's tabs were flying the street. Sam Weller is one of the famous tabs that his Pickwick started. And so uh, the taxi tabs in London, the horse, the horse drawn, uh, were named after Weller. Pickwick's name was written in gold. Versions of it were soon affixed to the most popular penny cigars at a writing pen, pen and Pickwick, Toby Muggs, Sawyer Crossroth, Weller Boots Office, and candy canes printed with Pickwickian rebels began to be sold. Uh, so they had to, you know, just the way a film comes out now and the down with the Burger King starts uh, having its name. Uh, uh, and what I really love, you can find the what I'm guessing is the first example of a product placement. Uh, 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 you know, in a film when the camera zooms in and the hero drinking Coca Cola, uh, or the, you know, he's got a Rolex watch on or something. That's not by accident. Well, uh, in one of the original illustrations of the Pickwick Papers, uh, uh, depicting Mr. Weller helping his son Samuel. The picture clearly shows a placard on the mantle reading distinctly Guinness Dublin Stout. <laughs> the placard was originally the wooden face side of the box today's Guinness. By uh, being replicated in the illustrations of Pickwick, it became an ad peeking out over Weller's head. Now, when I read the I thought, how ironic that it's a product, you know, so we used to make Guinness Stout. And then I realized, this ain't a lot of coincidence at all. If they were smart enough to get a product placement in a chicken job, <laughs> that's why they all still are. <laughs> but again, it's really, uh, it's, it's astounding to discover how commercial uh, this world is, as we now know. I don't think that's a, a bad thing. Uh, now, to say something more about the actual marketing and how books were published, uh, uh, as some of you may know, uh, uh, books were really quite expensive. Uh, at this time. It is very hard to compare prices, but uh, basically all it shows that uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, a book cost the equivalent of the average worker's day, a day's wages. So that was a lot to spend on a book. Uh, uh, a book does not cost anywhere near a day's wage for anybody. Uh, today, it shows you one of the things that was a capitalism, uh, uh, except from the university textbook. I take that back. Uh, there's socialist production for you. Uh, uh, capitalist production reduces the price of books. Uh, I could actually tell you something about that. Uh, but uh, uh, so books were, in fact, uh, certainly at the beginning of the century, expensive. Uh, uh, and so they were rented. Uh, this again comes as a shock to most people. As, uh, were you aware that books were rented uh, in the 19th century? They had what are called circulating libraries. Uh, and you rented, and you rented a book because you couldn't afford to buy it. That sounds so weird to us. I'll tell you start thinking about video rental. Uh, it used to be video cassette, now DVD. And you know, uh, a long time, you know, a video cassette would come out at a price of eighty dollars, so you didn't want to buy it, uh, and so instead you rented it for three dollars. And that's basically uh, how the uh, book industry made a lot of its money in the nineteenth century uh, through rentals, uh, and there were great circulating libraries, uh, uh, as you can well imagine. There were various arrangements. You could rent an individual book. You could get a pass for certain things that would allow you to rent a certain number of books uh, over a certain time and so on. There were other libraries where you could pay for fifty and you could read anything in the library. Again, there's the market for you. It came up with all... It's faced with the problem that books are initially too expensive uh, for people to buy. So it came up 
with a whole variety of solutions to make it possible for people who didn't have the money to buy books uh, to, to uh, rent them. Uh, uh, but of course, also, uh, uh, in the course of the century, uh, the price of books was reduced uh, uh, tremendously, so by the end of the 19th century, it was quite easy for people uh, uh, to buy books. Uh, the prices came down, and it, 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 uh, the pound essentially did not change in value uh, in the 19th century. It was that awful gold standard, you know, that's so terrible. It, was, it had this terrible result that the pound kept its value for the entire century. Uh, uh, and the price of books came down from 30 cents to one cent. At a, at a time when the value of the show was essentially unchanged. It was actually a little higher in 1900 than it was in 1800. And how did this happen? Again, through the operation of the market. And I could give you many examples. Uh, all this book, as he would never admit it, is filled with the story of one heroic and a capitalist entrepreneur after another whose only purpose was to make money and whose only step was to reduce the price of books. I'm just going to give you one example one of the great unsung heroes of culture. You will never, ever hear this man mentioned uh, certainly in any Marxist history or at least not in a positive way. But we should all bow down to James Rockington, the inventor of the remainder book sale. This is a great man. Uh, I hope this more than almost anybody except my remainder book seller today. Uh, uh, this goes back to the 18th century. Uh, James Lackington, who was the son of a journeyman shoemaker, and started out that way himself. Uh, he, he became a, a shoemaker, and then he converted to Methodism. And that was the turning point in his life because the Methodists wanted to finance the spread of books. They had the Bible in mind, they had John Hudson's servants in mind, and so they had a fund uh, for veterans to go into the book business. And, and Lackington availed himself uh, of this fund to set up a bookshop in London in 1774. And I'll just read from um, Alta here. He bought up large quantities of books at the auction where publishers periodically unloaded their slow moving stock. Uh, so that, you know, remainder books, books that aren't selling, publishers just want to get them off the shelf, get rid of them. So Lackey can blow them up, and then instead, instead of spending half or three quarters of the purchases to the trunk makers who use the paper for lining and selling what remains at the full price, he offered all the acquired at half or even a quarter of the public price. The first guy who broke uh, the sort of price fiction uh, a book uh, at the time. And again, most people who bought up books as a name of sales just dumped them then, sold them for uh, uh, stock value. Uh, but but Lackington had the brilliant idea of just we sell them, but at a fraction of the original cost. Uh, uh, I tell you, I don't doubt people that, but you, you lose money on each book. He said, well, I'll make it up and buy it. Uh, no, he understood he was buying and cheap. So he could sell it to This unheard of and to his colleagues in moral procedure brought down on him the wrath of the trade. But this was more than compensated for by the business he did with the bargain, bargain hunting public. Within a short time, he was the most lavish buyer of remainders in London. At one time, he boasted he had in stock 10,000 copies of Rock Song, uh, an equal number of his kids. At a single afternoon's auction, he bought 5,000 pounds worth of books. Uh, that's about $2 million worth of books uh, to, uh, today's money. Uh, uh, and that's, that's a $1 million, I mean. uh, But it, it, it's extraordinary. Notice, of course, one of these books by the Methodist finance. And, uh, uh, it's very interesting if you look at what uh, drove the book trade from the start. Uh, it was just the two great most of the human race. Uh, the Bible and pornography. Uh, this actually takes Kansas law uh, uh, of media. You go back, printing, Gutenberg, international printing. What was initially printed uh, in the early days of printing? Basically, the Bible, other religious facts, and the 
Renaissance equivalent of pornography. I think he's married from a delightful tale, a peaceful to a goal. Things like Bocasio's account of that. And there are some interesting things in the Christian law. What first spread on the internet? The Bible and pornography. I see it's like the higher and the lower two the motors. I will leave it to you to sort out which is which. Uh, uh, always drive the new medium. I think it's very movies. I mean, it's just it's, it's incredible to think of mankind gets a new medium. So it's like religious and pornographic material uh, published in that medium. And so here we see. Last week, again, with Methodist actually driven uh, by religious voters. I can't help going on with this. It's really. Why did it only really increase how some of the Orthodox books tell us and the further gratitude of readers? by cutting prices on new books, thus initiating the underselling practice that was to be animosity in the trade for the next hundred years. These steps, as well as the dealing with second-hand books that were sent up from the country, resulted in well-deserved prosperity. In 1791 and 1792, he says, it is engaged in the standard memoirs. He had an annual turnover of 100,000 bodies and a profit of 4,000 and 5,000 pounds. Uh, it's going to be multiplied by 200, yes, so that's, that's a million, million dollars in profit. Uh, the name of his bookstore was the Temple of the Muses. Washington Temple of the Muses in Finsbury Square was one of the sites of London. A large flock of houses had been turned into a shop, the whole surmounted by a dome and a flagpole. This bottle for a heavy this is Walmart, too. Listen to this. Over the main entrance appeared the sign whose cloud claim no one evidently challenged cheapest bookseller in the world. <laughs> Reportedly, the interior was so spacious that a coach and ship could be driven clear around it. In the center was a counter behind which the clerk waited on the fine ladies and country gentlemen who clustered about it. At one side, a staircase led by the lounging room and to a series of circular galleries under the drum. Doesn't it sound like Barnes and Noble and Borders to you? It's incredible. It's capitalism. No self <laughs> Around each of these galleries ran crowded cells. The higher the cells, the shabbier the buying and the lower the price. Nothing like the Temple of the Muses with its cut prices, its strict cash and carry policy, as the state of haggling had ever been in the book world. It was to keep prices low, uh, lacking to wouldn't sell on credit. Uh, and, you know, it seems so wonderful that we had trades and extended credit. Uh, and you really didn't have to have the money to get what you wanted. But, but uh, the, the result of that was higher prices for everybody because so many people defaulted, uh, never paid their bills. So Latin had said, if you want a book, you pay for it now. I'll get you the cheapest price, but I'm not going to give you credit. And there was also no hazard, no, no bargaining. Uh, 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 and, uh, as soon as Rob Lashley has said, thousands have been effectively prevented from purchasing, though anxious so to do, whose circumstances in life would not permit them to pay the full price, and thus were totally excluded from the advantage of improving their understanding and enjoying a rational entertainment. Uh, now, Lashley is uh, one of the great examples, but you read this book in these two At no point does Alfred get a step back and say, you know, this is not possible to really accomplish something. Uh, but he tells one story or another of uh, the man who was the king of the circulating library, who was a man named Moody or Moody, it's M U D I E, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, uh, we can recognize these people. They are Sam Walton, uh, they are Ray Clark, they're the same kind of people that build businesses today. And it's the same philosophy, give the public what it wants, reduce costs in every possible way, market effectively. I mean, it worked now and it worked then. But the thing I understand what they were effectively marketing was things like Chicken Thomas. Now, Lackland is uh, earlier than that, but he obviously built the basis uh, for the retail trade uh, in the one that made uh, book making possible. Now, again, to Marxists, they're, they're so obsessed with production. Uh, they look at distribution and marketing as a totally negative thing uh, that add no value. Uh, they always see distributors, middlemen, marketers as pure exploiters. You know, the only person, you know, they got the labor theory of value, so the only person who deserves the war is the laborer. Uh, you know, they would complain 
and a lot of things making all this money, and the poor guys in the sweatshop, print shop, uh, are not making anything either. Side. Well, those guys would have no job if Washington wasn't moving the product they were producing. Uh, he, he, as a retailer, is performing a special economic function. He's there, uh, actually, as a mediator between the printing industry and the book buying public. Uh, and he was someone who was always figuring out what does the public want, uh, uh, what should be printed. Uh, 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 so, in fact, he was performing uh, a vital social and cultural function, and that's why he made all the money uh, he did. Now, uh, let me turn uh, maybe the most important aspect of the sitting public uh, industry in the 19th century, and that was still in the uh, Again, I'm not sure how much we're aware of this fact, uh, but uh, uh, many of the novels uh, in the 19th century, including Dickens, were not originally published in book form. They were serialized. Uh, uh, and that means they either appear in magazines, uh, sometimes on a bi weekly basis, sometimes on a monthly basis, depending upon the magazine, or they were actually published in separate parts. Um, a, a typical novel, when it was eventually published in book form in the 19th century, occupied three volumes. The famous three decker novel was called. Uh, uh, and a three decker novel, if it appeared in serial parts, are usually appeared in 20 parts. And usually over a period of roughly a year or a year and a half. Uh, uh, now, one of the reasons serialization became popular is because novels and book form were too expensive. And so people, for example, like the idea of buying a novel uh, part by part over a year and a half. And again, I mean, the figures vary, but let's say, you know, uh, maybe let's say the, uh, the novel, the, in book form, the novel would cost 15 shillings, uh, and you may have 15 shillings, but you buy it over the course of a year, one shilling apart 20 times. Now, it does end up costing you 20 shillings when it's 15, but you have, you know, it's, it's like, that's like buying on credit or extended plan. You know, today it's like the TV is sold or these time life books are sold. That system of marketing was developed uh, in uh, uh, the 19th century. And God bless the Catholic. Again, they came up with teams. If you bought it, uh, if you bought all 20 parts, you get a binding for free at the end. Or if you bought 20 parts, you only had to pay for 19 of them and you got the 20 of free. I mean, they had every marketing gimmick then that we think of as so uh, specific to the 20th century. And if you go to the Dickens house in London, you can see all this stuff. You can see the action of Dickens, Dickens, the Dickens mugs and the Dickens watches and all this stuff. You can see uh, the parts publication. They, they still have them. I mean, there's still hundreds of thousands of them that come with the uh, copies of the Bible. And it's fascinating to look uh, at the, the part features of Dickens. They, they're on, you know, faded, crumbling paper. Look at the new sheet paper. They kind of look like comic books. They have the female account. If you understand how pop culture they were, uh, uh, they have, I won't, they won't have lurid illustrations on the cover, but the covers are kind of fancy, and you can just see how they, they were marketed. And so, a lot of, uh, again, a lot of the most famous 19th century novels, not all of them, but many of them appear in this form, uh, magazines, uh, uh, like them because they boosted circulation. And if you could, if you could be publishing a popular novel, uh, it was great for circulation. In fact, they know uh, this was how they first started publishing the uh, uh the, the incredible numbers of, uh, of parts or magazines. So Dickens eventually started his own magazine, uh, uh, Household Words, which was quite successful for about a decade, and he's, uh, his main asset was himself. He published his own novel, yes, but he also spotted young talent, uh, like Elizabeth Gaskell, published uh, uh, her novel, North and South, The Household Words. And it's absolutely fascinating. Most of the college libraries have copies of Household Words, uh, uh, and you can go through it 
Uh, and if this it looks like a modern magazine, uh, there'll be uh, an article on India and the latest agricultural methods in India. There'll be an article uh, on uh, how to fix the wagon wheel, uh, an article on a new scientific discovery. I mean, it looks like Time Magazine, uh, uh, you know, they like to have the part, they don't quite have the problem, but you can see it was aiming for a middle class audience. Uh, it's kind of interested in what's going on around the world. It's interested in how to fix it. That sort of thing. And it's interesting to fix it. Now, uh, uh, it's good enough how, uh, you know, just to see how the market responded to a problem that books were still too expensive and to publish the, the, the work in serial form. Uh, but, uh, uh, what people learn to do now was to make a virtue of necessity and exploit this form. Uh, again, I have to know what, in what respect, serial publication looks absolutely good, uh, uh, artistically and, 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 uh, uh, and financially and commercially, but it's not as if some genius sat down and planned out this system. People kind of stumbled into it. It was precisely an example of spontaneous order in the Austrian sense. Uh, that people tried out various methods uh, and they saw what worked and eventually developed a very sophisticated method of producing uh, uh, and marketing uh, a novel. Uh, now, what I mean about exploiting the form is that pretty quickly people figured out the cliffhanger principle. Uh, that is, uh, if you were going to publish the thing in part over a relatively long time, a year, year and a half, you really wanted to keep those readers coming back to buy more. Uh, you know, at first, again, no one was quite thinking about this. No one had ever done anything quite like this. The serial publication sort of begins in the 18th century, as you see from the 18th century journals, uh, but it really flourishes. I mean, the, the first great success is getting Pickwick papers in the 1830s. Uh, uh, but people start feeling the way, you know, at first they just go, well, you know, it's a rather well novel, it's a divide up, it's a 20 equal parts, and it's a concept. And then Pickwick started to get a feel for how to end a part. A part was typically about three chapters worth. Uh, but you start to notice uh, that at the end of the part, Someone was about to die, <laughs> uh, or a, there was a knock on the door. <laughs> Who could that possibly be? You know, continued next month. Uh, uh, and you know, this is one of the great characteristics of Victorian uh, fiction. We lose a lot of that actually when we read uh, uh, the novel uh, uh, in a book. Uh, a lot of good modern editions actually now mark off the part, and you can actually see where a part ends. And so you can replace that uh, 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 pattern. And actually, you know, in fact, in many ways, the way we, you know, especially in the academic world, when you do a book a week, like, we don't read these novels the way they were meant to be read. They actually were meant to be read over a long period of time. You sit there and see a thousand page Dickens novel and say, how the hell do we do some more weeks? That was not the original intention. In some ways, we spoil the effect of them. And uh, I put on the original bibliography uh, a book by uh, Jennifer Hayward, Consuming Pleasures. The terrific book, uh, it, it's all about the serial as the modern form. That's S E R I A M, by the way. I like to do this as much as the next guy, but I'm talking about about fiction here. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, he was really came to the conclusion. The book is about Dickens' novel, uh, the Perry and the Pirate comic strip, radio soap operas, and television soap operas. And she really made this leap of imagination to see that the serial actually is the modern form of culture. Uh, uh, and she talks about its unique characteristics that you can trace through all these genres. Now, one obvious example would be the cliffhanger principle. We name it after movie serial. 
where, you know, at the end of the part, someone was hanging on a cliff and he wondered if he or she would fall to his uh, or her death. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, who killed J.R.? You know, the greatest cliffhanger in history. Uh, so when you think about it, television soap operas, the radio soap this has always been a very popular uh, genre uh, uh, in all different forms, and she really talks about its distinctive characteristics. I mean, we have a tendency, uh, in some ways, to misread these Victorian novels because we apply to them, you know, we're, we should be applying to them standards of television soap operas and not those with Robertian, uh, perfectly uh, 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 planned and conceived novels. And the, I'll maybe talk about this when we get to the X Files uh, on Friday. That, that there are certain ways in which television, uh, you know, has developed a serial form, and it is a new kind of art form with a with a new aesthetic uh, in many ways, and it's able to do things that other forms uh, can't. And again, the uh, the serial form is generally associated with the lowest forms of pop culture in people's minds, so popular. And yet, it actually is a subtle art form and allows for kinds of deep and long term development in character, in plot, uh, that many of the more traditional, you know, uh, Sophocles' Oedipus is a brilliantly concentrated piece of drama uh, uh, and all of the, you know, happening in really time, uh, and that's a great art form. But there's also something you said for the enormously sprawling canvas of a Dickens novel, which was largely made possible by the leisurely method of delivery. Uh, that again, Dickens uh, not only knew that his audience had a year, year and a half to wait, but he was making them wait. He was drawing things out. Uh, uh, and these things can be incredibly well planned. So, uh, it's very distinctive to the 19th century novel. I mean, with the, well, again, some were not uh, published in the theory. Some of the, the great ones were not. But, but many of them uh, were published serially. Uh, and that had commercial reasons. It was a form of production that was effective. It was a form of marketing uh, that was effective. Uh, uh, and a lot of what we need to do to understand these novels uh, the ones that were serialized is to understand the consequences of serialization, and some of them were negative and some of them were positive. Let me begin uh, with the uh, negative ones, because again, I'm, I'm deliberately trying not to play down some of the negative aspects uh, of uh, the, uh, the commercialization uh, of uh, literature. Uh, and in fact, many of the writers at the time complaining about civilization, and some of them uh, try to avoid it. I uh, have some quotes here that I'll read in a minute to try to find them. But uh, uh, let's look at some of the negative effects. Uh, civilization meant uh, you had to write to a certain length, uh, and the novel couldn't be shorter or longer. Uh, and in fact, people signed a contract. Uh, I'm going to produce this novel for you at, uh, I'm going to do 20 parts, I'm going to pay so much for 20 parts over this schedule, and you then had a schedule. I mean, they were not going to have 18 empty pages in the next, next issue of the magazine or miss the date on the part. And so you had to write to a schedule, uh, and you know, <laughs> if you were on part 19 and you had 18 plot lines still going, the publisher then said to me, it's time to wrap it up for, for quite some. The whole thing has to not end for the next issue. Resolve all 18 first plot lines. And you said, could I need 17 more parts to resolve this? No, that now is going to end the next month. Uh, and similarly, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's uh, invention flag. It didn't know what it is. You have to produce something. Uh, I'm trying to get there. We have correspondence. Uh, sometimes some different the authors work on you know, turning what to do or wrap it up or speed it up or slow it down. Or, uh, and so, uh, 
uh, this is an example of negative commercial pressure. Uh, uh, and many authors did uh, complain bitterly about the system, but I don't want to overlook it. So let me give you some short quotes. This is from Alan Dewey's book, Author and Printer. Terrific book on the uh, sort of the publication details of the industry. The 19th century, I put it on your supplementary bibliography. He gives us the example of Anthony Trollope, you know, one of the greatest and the most, one of the most successful novels. He wrote, I think, a hundred novels. Uh, and his sister and his mother, and there's a Trollope family with the whole novel industry up in itself. Trollope calls uh, this system the hurried publication of incompleted work. Uh, and he tells us, quote, the rushing mode of publication to which the system of serial stories had given rise and by which small parts of them were written were sent hot to the press was injurious to the work done. And so there is Trollope, one of the best, most successful novels of time, says this system is injurious. Uh, uh, and Julie goes on to say, to Trollope's the serious system when it came to affect not only the publication, but also the initial composition of work resulted in a loss of artistic control. So there is a standard complaint against commercialization of art that it results in loss of artistic control and loss for the author. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a serious But there was a solution and Saul found it. The customary protection against pressure that might have led to hasty publication was to complete a novel and revise it thoroughly before sending it to any of the, uh, any of the two publishers. Uh, if serial issue was planned, he then needed out the manuscript to the printer while he went to work on his next book. So again, there was a, there's a market problem, there was a solution. If you didn't like this system, uh, and you were incredibly fluent at writing his but you just wrote the book to your liked it, and then pretended you were writing it month by month for the publisher. So, market problems, market solutions, uh, uh, another example, very interesting one, is from Harriet Martineau, who was one of the great unsung writers uh, of the Victorian age because she was so capital. Uh, if you ever want to have a fun, read her illustrations of political economy. A little bit too much David Ricardo in her economics, but basically uh, it's one lesson after another in how uh, trade unions are bad, free trade is good, it's really that uh, she was the uh, Bastiat uh, of England. Uh, she really is a marvel writer. I try to introduce her. Uh, it's horrific uh, to discover that the most successful female writer in England of the first half of the 19th century uh, was not just pro capitalist, but rapidly pro capitalist. Uh, she would sell 30,000 copies of one of these illustrations at close to time. Finally, Broadwood. Uh, the Canadian press has uh, uh, a broad view, it's like broad view, has brought has brought some of these tales back in the print. Harriet Martineau, M A R T I N E A U. He did write a serial method of production. Uh, and in her autobiography, he said, I could not conscientiously adopt any method so unprincipled in an artistic sense as PG or publication. Whatever other merits that they have, a work of fiction cannot possibly be good in an artistic sense which can be cut up into portions of an arbitrary life. The success of the portions requires that each should have some sort of effective flow. He knows the cliffhanger principle. And to provide a certain number of these at regular intervals is like breaking up the broad lights and shadows of a great picture and spoiling it as a composition. I might never do anything to advance or sustain literary art, but I would never do nothing. I would never do double negative. I would never do nothing to corrupt it by adopting a false principle of composition. So there it is, Harriet Martin, who is incredibly pro Catholic, does not like this aspect of commercial publication and civilization and wouldn't do it. Um, here's an example in, in the case of uh, Elizabeth Gaspar. Uh, one of the also so fabulous, by the way. Uh, her, her novel, North and South, is a defense of the industrial system of England. This is actually an amazing story. Dickens was writing hard times and publishing it in household words. His attack on the industrial Midlands, and and Gaskell wanted to write a defense of it, and Dickens published it. Uh, why did the King, his, her first novel sold well? He liked it. He wanted to get it in his magazine. In fact. 
gospel spoke to us in Calvary that hope is sufficient if in hard times, and spoke by hard times, he was a very good sort of view of the industrial midland. Uh, but yeah, uh, uh, Dickens uh, had an ideological problem with uh, gospel, but he published it because he could make money that way if he had to try and fix the commercial system. Uh, but when they planned out the publication of North and South, Dickens was calculated. And so the actual, uh, he pressured her uh, to make the work shorter uh, than uh, he intended. Uh, this is from, uh, I'm quoting from an edition of the novel, the page of the edition. But from her viewpoint, constituted the worst impression was that made in the last few chapters of the novel. Uh, so, uh, uh, again, I'm not denying that this is the result of Dickens himself uh, in talking about one of his own early serial publications, when he was the old curiosity, curiosity shop, said, I was obliged to plant most dreadfully what I thought a pretty idea uh, in the last chapter. I had not room to turn. Uh, and so even Dickens felt at times like comfortable with the system. Now, there was an answer to that, which was that, uh, uh, yes, uh, the novel was initially published serially, uh, but then, particularly if it was successful, it would be republished in book form. And at that time, authors had the opportunity to revise them. So, this example, uh, with North and South, Gastro expanded the ending for the book form that was enforced to protect the material form. So, again, market problem, market solution. Uh, it's, you know, nasty that uh, they had a rush to finish some of the novels. But it's not the end of the world because it wasn't the end of the book. Uh, and again, the market gives me the second fan. Uh, and so, you know, it's a great scholarly enterprise now to get compared to serial publications uh, of the novel with the uh, uh, eventual book uh, publications. So, again, I, I, this is an example where we have really detailed information. And I can show you, I don't have to speculate what Fox felt about his patron or things like that. We, we have records here. Uh, that show uh, that artists were uncomfortable with certain aspects of a system that had uh, was developed for largely commercial reasons. But there's another side to the story, uh, uh, and uh, I've given you some time for the negative case against civilization. And let me talk about the positive case, uh, and that is that civilization became an incredible feedback system. Uh, and one of the things I want to argue from here on in with increasing frequency is that what characterizes commercial culture is feedback. Uh, and here's where the relation of an artist to his public is important and how it can actually improve his work or her work in the case of people like Harriet Martin and, uh, and Elizabeth Gaston. Uh, uh, and by the way, again, as, you know, I, I mentioned that Gasco and Martin Noble were very sympathetic to capitalism. And with good reason, because capitalism was very good to a woman in the publishing business in the 1970s. You can talk about every system uh, of uh, finance in the arts, patronage, government funding. Nothing ever opened up more opportunities for women in culture than 19th century British publishing. Uh, and, uh, and more than half the novels were written by women in the that were published in the 19th century of Britain. And there's no record like that anywhere else in culture up to that point. And it's not because Charles Dickens, as a publisher, was a feminist. It's because he was a capitalist. Uh, uh, and he wanted to publish talent, and he didn't care who wrote the book if he thought it was bad. Uh, uh, in some cases, women had to publish under male names. Thought they had to be like uh, George Eliot, Mary Ann Evans, uh, or the Bronte sisters, uh, 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 were like caught on Saturday Night Live. They were initially published under sexually ambiguous names. Uh, 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 Tara, Tara, uh, Tara acted in Ellis Bell, that was Charlotte Ann, uh, and then in Bronte, originally. Uh, so, but still, an incredible opportunity, uh, you know, the greatest cultural opportunity yet open for women in the world is the 19th century uh, of British publishing industry. Uh, so, uh, let me now turn to the way in which the serial system actually had a positive effect on literature. And that is that 
novelists could watch the reaction of their audience as they were. Uh, uh, and this took several forms. Uh, uh, Part publications were in some ways, some cases, reviewed as they came out, you know, and you see reviews, you know, like uh, reviews of TV shows, uh, uh, you know, oh, the latest installment of uh, Oliver Twist uh, is terrific. Uh, Dickens has carried the story on a Dickens style, or, or you know, something's going wrong with Dombey and Son. It's getting a little dark. Dickens, you know, we love you for for the last area. Uh, so there might actually be reviews. There was certainly word of mouth uh, and a sales figure, uh, uh, and that was quite easy uh, uh, to start. Uh, and so. Uh, Authors couldn't always tell uh, why the sales figure was changing, but they seemed to have pretty good guesses. And so you get a phenomenon in the Victorian novel uh, that is very similar to what we see uh, in uh, uh, TV soap operas, uh, and that is the life and death of a character hung on sales figures. Uh, uh, Sometimes, uh, no, you know this in soap operas on TV. Uh, you know, it, uh, they try all sorts of different characters, and they can tell which ones click and which ones don't. Which ones don't. So often, also cases which actors uh, uh, click or, or don't. But, but you know, uh, one week uh, characters very healthy in the soap opera. Next week, you develop a rare form of cancer and is gone by the end of the month. Uh, similarly, you know, a delivery boy, you know, brings a pizza uh, and let's say the very handsome, you know, suddenly they write a romance <laughs> with uh, one of the characters. And, you know, this is even true uh, to some extent uh, uh, on prime time shows. I mean, I'll drop ahead to the X Files here. Uh, the uh, the X Files, um, once you introduce these characters, the lone gunman, the three nerdy uh, computer types that help Mulder. And uh, the, the uh, I think it was Glenn Morgan that did the episode. I mean, he thought it had failed, and you know, what a silly idea that was. Uh, he decided, and then uh, fortunately, they were just this one episode. And then the internet lit up. Of all the computer districts who identified with the lone gunman and said, you know, it's the greatest thing we've ever seen this show, bring it back, bring it back. And you know, the rest of the history, they eventually got their own spin off series. They certainly were one of the great things over the years. And the X Files, that's been back. And in that case, the author didn't realize, the author of the characters didn't even realize how good they were. He didn't actually see the potential in them. And if there hadn't been an internet, no more lone gunmen, uh, uh, and again, they don't make or break the series, but they really ended up adding a great element to it. And that's why I mean when I talk about feedback in a serial mode, where there's ways of monitoring and ordering interaction. Now, you know, again, it is a sort of a hard classic Epstein's mode of criticism or the Marxist mode of criticism. That lone gunman episode is an example of market corruption. Uh, that Glenn Morgan had this pure artistic vision and he allowed it to be corrupted by the impact of the market. Uh, oh, if only he'd been true to his own disgust with his creation. Uh, uh, but, you know, in retrospect, it seems the audience was right and Morgan was wrong. Uh, that he stumbled upon something that was really good. He didn't understand the potential, but the market did. And fortunately, the market was there to steer it put them on course. Now, this is the feature of all serial production. And Hayley's book is very good uh, on tracing it. Uh, he wrote on the Terry and the Pirates comic strip. He was the creator of it, had saved all his fan mail and made it uh, 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 available to her and explained to her how he listened to his fans. Uh, you know, the fans are great. They tell you exactly what they think. We like this character. We hate that character. Fans the powers that go to Brazil. This <laughs> time, uh, or, you know, <laughs> uh, like uh, with the Simpsons, you know, Canadians love the Simpsons. But 
you know, the big pictures went to Japan, they went to Australia, but they never went to Canada, okay? And that's because why some decisions got to Canada? Well, some decisions finally went to Canada. Maybe the Canadians are so funny. But again, these are the things that happen that make uh, modern popular culture so vibrant. Uh, one of the charges of Marxism, and it's a great Frankfurt School argument, is that mass, capitalist mass culture produces passive consumers. Uh, that they just sit there and take it to point to you, uh, that Hollywood or, you know, capitalist, uh, the capitalist culture industry, all kinds of things, but so they can market everything. Well, tell that uh, to the guy who produced this car, or the guy who produced uh, uh, Battlefield Earth, or the guy who produced Waterworld, uh, that Hollywood can market anything. Uh, um, and that's the added to the leaders of a great book called Fiasco about Hollywood's great marketing, production, and marketing standards. Uh, but it's really amazing that uh, the uh, Frankfurt School basis argument on no evidence whatsoever has killed the beginning of a very important movement in popular culture studies uh, coming out of the, oddly enough, from a Marxist orientation, but, but to look at the active consumer in popular culture, uh, not the passive consumer. Uh, it's led by a professor at MIT named Henry Jenkins, uh, whom I'll refer to several times now, but he uh, did some of the first studies of fan fiction. Uh, and so the audience of Star Trek, for example, is not passive. They have taken suggestions of the show and the characters. As we know about these fan themes, uh, uh, fans create, uh, especially from the original Star Trek, stories that Dean Roddenberry never imagined. Things are happening on the internet between Scott and Kirk that Dean Roddenberry never dreamed of. These are fans have taken over the characters. They're not going to sit back passively. Uh, and and um, uh, Jenkins has written a book about that. Uh, they're called posters. That's now the technical term for active fans. Uh, and what I'm saying is that goes all the way back to Dickens' novel. And, and, and uh, Hayward's book uh, includes that. And he sees it as this wonderful aspect of modern mass culture uh, that it involves feedback. Uh, and we see the phenomenon, uh, uh, this is actually an example from Hayward's including present, uh, uh, about Dickens. He gravely expanded Sam Weller's role in Pickwick Papers with a sales jump to 40,000. After Sam's first appearance, uh, and nothing had ever sold 40,000 copies of Jersey Jeff the Tiger uh, when, when this happened. And you know, things went through the roof. Uh, another example uh, of this uh, is uh, with Old Curiosity Shop. Let me see if I can find my figures on this. The Dickens uh, 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 hadn't even intended it to be a novel. Uh, he was just putting it together. Uh, one of the miscellaneous essays, there's other things. Uh, but um, uh, uh, he's just going to, you know, it's just sort of a loose collection of tales and essays. But he introduced the character of Little Nell. Uh, uh, and just the appearance of Little Nell in one of the parts of publication uh, uh, increased the circulation from 60,000. 100,000. And that was a great story. It was the first movie that you know, sold $100 million. The first thing that ever sold $100,000. And suddenly, they can decide, I'm going to write a novel about Bill Nell. And it took a lot of uh, scrambling on his part. Uh, and he got a lot of things wrong in the book after that. Uh, 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 this is from the uh, 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 man in Eastern and his introduction to the body. The awful result of this last minute expansion of the little tale can be detected in the early part of the novel. The malicious talk of Fred Penn is soon dropped as Dickens prefers to develop the far more spectacular analysis of Quilt and Dick Swiller's engaging prophecy. The Sophie Wackles episode proves to be a hilarious irrelevancy 
shift, we introduce the harmless semi-linguist, occasionally some light rings in chapter one, by some 20 chapters later, has become a certain responsible young man. So, uh, this quick decision to change the least collection of essays and tales into a novel resulted in a kind of aesthetic mess there, but resulted in a novel that has a great deal of energy to tip to tap into the energy of the novel. That's the point, you know, the X5 people through the internet to tap into the energy of their audience, uh, Haywood Tracy and the correspondence between the, the, uh, the guy who did Terry and Fire Dog, I forget his name, uh, and his audience. Uh, uh, and it is a feedback loop, and that's what's characteristic of spontaneous order. Uh, uh, the Hayek is shown, and of course, it's really in some ways, you know, the essence of all true economics uh, that, that, that economics is a feedback, that the market is a feedback loop. The way the market works in general uh, is that people try to anticipate what will sell, uh, sometimes through marketing studies and things like that. They try to figure out what will sell, they try to figure out how to produce it at a price uh, at which they can sell it, uh, and a lot of planning goes into it, uh, but you never know until you bring the product to market. Uh, and it's typical of markets uh, that the majority of new products fail. Uh, uh, it's just that when they succeed, they succeed big, because so many people are failing. Uh, uh, and the thing that happens in the market is when you succeed, you really push what succeeds. Then everyone comes in from copying uh, what succeeded. Uh, if you're the original uh, marketer, you have to work harder, uh, cut your costs, improve your product. And how do you improve your product? Trying to figure out what made it sell, listening to your customers, uh, uh, how you can improve your product. That's the way markets work, and it's no different in culture. You know anything about the television business, movie business, that's exactly the way it operates. Uh, critics, uh, and I hear about being academics, they think we somehow failed if we didn't uh, plan out everything perfectly in advance. And they somehow think it would be possible to plan out everything perfectly in advance. That's the socialist way of thinking. That's the thinking behind central planning. Uh, in general, when socialists look at the market, they see all the failure. They see all the messiness. Uh, they say, there's got to be a more rational way to do this. This is the stupidest way to do things. All these different people trying things out. Look, so many of them are failing. Look at all the ways and resources. If we could just get together and plan it out, it would work perfectly. But no. Of course, then you have one giant failure. Uh, because uh, nobody can anticipate everything perfectly. So if you're only making one guess, the odds are tremendous that that could be wrong, and then everybody's screwed. Uh, the way markets work is a lot of somebody succeeds, and then everyone can start copying that, and you get better ways of doing things. Uh, uh, that's the way the market economy works itself. And what I'm saying is that's, in fact, the way the cultural markets work. You see it in films and television, but you can see it already in uh, the, the 19th century uh, uh, novel. Uh, uh, that, yes, novelists planned out their novels in advance, even when they were doing serial publication. Uh, we had the inspector, for example. Uh, uh, when he starts the novel, he tries to figure out who the characters are going to be, so have notes when to introduce them. He may have an ending in mind. Uh, you see, in some cases, he's talking about aesthetic principles. You should know, have a chapter chap here to balance that chapter there. He was a good novel writer, yeah. But the finished novel never follow the initial plan. He's supposed to have the initial plan. He always revised in the course of production. Now, again, a Marxist would say he's revising under commercial pressure, and that makes the novels worse. Uh, and many experts would say, many of the new critics would have said this, uh, he's putting in, he's compromising, uh, uh, he, he, he's selling out, uh, and you know, this will be repeated to, to even to the video game market now, they're talking about people selling out the commercial pressures in the video game market. Uh, and there is some aspect of that, and I've pointed to it, there are, you can definitely see times when the novel uh, um, have problems with the stickings they're giving to 
it's pretty commercial. Um, but uh, if, if the customer is not always right, it's also true that he's not always wrong. And sometimes what the public was telling Dickens was right. Uh, and he recognized that. Uh, he realized uh, that some characters weren't working or ought to be killed off. Uh, he realized some of the characters had much more potential than he realized uh, and they could uh, uh, be expanded. Uh, uh, one of the books I've recommended uh, called The Ladies' Literature, Money in the Market, great title, uh, talks about Thackeray uh, when uh, in writing the uh, last uh, chronicle uh, of Boston, uh, he decided to kill off his character, which is Crowley. And you see, you know, both sides, just as you spoke about it, some characters are standalone, some characters as soon as you die, if the public doesn't seem uh, to like them. And that sounds very crude um, uh, to people. I mean, it, 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 the, the market can be crude, but it's effective because it's crude. Uh, and again, you can see the. Uh, someone with the aesthetic of Paul Bear, someone with the aesthetic of James Joyce, a uh, novel must be absolutely perfect, uh, every word must be perfect, uh, no one word should be added, no one word should be subtracted. I, I don't deny the greatness of that aesthetic, and there have been novelists, uh, especially modern novelists, who work on that principle. Uh, you know, to read something like Joyce is fortunately honest, you see how perfectly constructed it is, and how perfectly every sentence is constructed. And every, it, it's really amazing and it's great. And, uh, 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 but it's not the only valid aesthetic. No one could ever say of a Dickens novel, you lose one word and the entire structure falls. Remember that in the movie last night? It was most of it. Uh, uh, you know, the, that is a legitimate aesthetic. The, uh, the, aesthetic, the, the aesthetic of perfection. And many of the greatest works of art have been produced by artists like that. And it's uh, typically characteristic of poetry. You know, when you've got a 20 line poem, indeed you want every word to be perfect. And you want to be able to say the great little poem, remove one word, and there will be diminishment, as Sally Ann has said. But a 1,000 page Dickens novel, remove one word, and there will be diminishment? Thank God. <laughs> uh, uh, and again, it's hilarious that uh, Dewey faces this. In the absence of printing, strange things happen. There is very much on record uh, that novels have come to print. Sometimes not just with a word missing, but a whole stack of missing. Um, the editor missed it, the author missed it completely. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, there probably was something uh, overlong about the novel if that could happen. Uh, and so, you know, uh, it is characteristic of popular culture that it does not have the aesthetic perfection of a modernist lyric by you, or even of a, uh, of a great classic art novel by a Flaubert or a Joyce. But it compensates for that with other virtues. Uh, what we tend to get in popular culture, uh, as you know, here I'm talking about Dickens, uh, what makes the Dickens novel so good uh, is the vitality of it, uh, 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 the richness of the canvas. You, you can't have everything. You can't have the aesthetic perfection of a brief modernist lyric through a kaleidoscope of human life, as you get in the Dickens novel. Uh, uh, the weakness of Dickens novels is the strength of Dickens novels. Uh, 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 Henry James, who was such an essay, complained about other people's novels as loose baggy monsters. Uh, uh, and there's a certain truth to that. But there's also a certain prettiness to the purpose and credit of Henry James. Uh, and, you know, I basically think the public case is vindicated, you know, it's a good novel to change uh, a novel, but let my aesthetic friends never hear me say that. Uh, uh, but what I'm saying is that uh, this, there's a kind of looseness, but at the same time, richness to modern popular cultural form from Dickens' serialized novels down to uh, uh, serialized television. Uh, and it, uh, there's something wrong about applying the aesthetic 
of a Flaubert novel or a Yeats lyric to a Dickens novel or to a television series like The X-Files. They're very different things, produced under different conditions with different audiences in view, uh, uh, and they each have their defects uh, and, and their virtues. Uh, and what I'm saying about uh, the serialized novel here is a real example of a marketed commodity uh, with all the aspects of capitalist production, uh, standardized production, mass production, the need for cost cutting, the need for marketing, buying products, all these things. Uh, 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 that's the financial underpinning of it and why the Victorian novel attracted such talent in the 19th century. Uh, I said this about the Elizabethan theater. It was a way uh, to offer economic and social mobility at a time uh, when it was not generally available. Uh, well, economic and social mobility had increased greatly in the 19th century, uh, but there's always room for more uh, and it became clear that there was money to be made in fiction writing. Uh, I've seen various figures on this, but I think, uh, I think there was something like 40,000 novels published in England in the course of the 19th century. That's actually a pretty staggering feature, a figure uh, uh, of which I'm I doubt that more than 200 are read by anybody today, including professors of Victorian literature. Uh, of those 200, about 50 of them are canonical. Uh, that's really staggering, but that's what culture is like. That's why I'm trying to get across to you that, that when we look at television and say it's a vast wasteland and it's just full of junk, uh, you can't believe how much junk there was in Victorian novel. I'm interested in money and mummy stories. I love the mummy movies. I went back and read uh, a novel. Uh, I think this is the first uh, mummy novel called The Mummy of a Woman in Ryden. Um, it's called the 1840s. I discovered it by Esther. And there's, thank God, there's only a bridgement available. I mean, this is unspeakably bad. Uh, you just can't begin to understand. It's not like uh, a bad novel. It's just she can't tell a story. She can't. I mean, you realize why this novel's unread. I mean, take the worst Victorian novel you ever had to read in college, and it's a fifty times worse. Uh, and you know, uh, I I just can't imagine how bad some of these other novels were. I'm never going to find out. It's like you told I'm never going to read them. Uh, but you know, it is easily as bad as the worst movie ever made. I mean, we're saying Plan 9 of Outer Space of the, of the 19th century novel here. Uh, we're telling you the other But this is the way, this is the way markets in general operate and the way I say cultural markets operate. You just try everything. And the way to try everything is open up the market. Uh, and there was relative ease of entry uh, to the business of writing novels. You just, I mean, paper becomes cheap enough for people to sit down and write these novels. And then you just took a chance to move in public. But what I'm getting at, there was no way of knowing ahead of time which novel would be the great one. You know, that's the, the social dream of central planning. It's the aesthetic dream that somewhere with uh, artistic people that they told me that, you know, you should sit down and which is, you know, why waste writing 40,000 novels to produce 50 good ones? Uh, you know, you know, that's why I say, you know, uh, why have 40,000 toothpaste? Toothpaste is the word. But uh, that's right. Uh, people can't figure out ahead uh, while we work at an art is even more complicated than some of the simpler things uh, uh, in economics. Presumably, it's easier to design a toothpaste than to write a novel. Uh, uh, but uh, so, when, again, today when we look at the Victorian novel, we see those 50 great novels. Uh, you know, 15 is spent by 50, uh, and say, wow, what a cultural piece. And look uh, at all these bad movies in the 20th century. Well, if you took the 50 greatest movies of the 20th century, I'm going on record, they are better than the 50 greatest novels of the 19th century in all of Europe. Uh, 
in the uh, novels that would be the aesthetic equivalent of George Eliot and Thackeray and the Bronte, they are selling in larger numbers now. Uh, the Howard makes this point well, but what upsets people is again the envy principle, the relative principle. They are frustrated that uh, uh, Dan Brown sells many more copies than, let's say, Don Gallo. I had an enemy of the living American novel. Uh, I said Don, Don Delillo. But Don Delillo sells in larger numbers than the Bronte sisters ever did, uh, and by a rather large figure. Uh, and he got a million dollar advance, I believe, for uh, uh, what was the underworld. Uh, and he's been able to uh, live uh, on his uh, creative novel. Uh, so so uh, 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 the relative numbers look bad, the absolute numbers look really good. Uh, that, that is, art, what we would call art novels now, uh, actually sell uh, larger numbers of books than what we now, in retrospect, call the art novels of the 19th century. So, it's, you know, the, the, the complaint is out as if uh, art novels now can't make a living at it. That's untrue. Look at Thomas Pinkney, for example, writing on the new and incomprehensible Dimensy novel. You know, Bradley's Rainbow born him to be a best seller. So, uh, you know, the world, again, never say that the capital world is perfect. It's uh, better than the alternative. Uh, I mean, you know, government system is trying to pick out ahead of time uh, which, uh, which novelists are the ones who should be allowed to write and publish it. So, on that, uh, that certainly wouldn't work. And we'll see that when we look at some of the totalitarian uh, uh, systems. Uh, so, it, to me, it's not a market failure uh, that Dan Brown can be successful. Uh, the other thing I would say is that the 19th century novel was the center of popular culture in Britain and the center of artistic culture. So, the fact is, the novel as a whole has been displaced in the 20th century uh, by the movie. Uh, and and again, the record of the motion picture in the same thing has absolutely found it. Uh, and I would say, you know, uh, the cultural achievement of motion picture is as great as virtually any other artistic field in human history with the exception of Century Play. Other question? Yes. Well, that is a, 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 I realize I've never seen the question for the uh, internet audience. Uh, the, the question is, uh, uh, what's my response to the fact that we really don't have free markets, we have a mixed economy, and indeed I was thinking at that, and it's something I really uh, should dwell on more. Uh, I've been talking about uh, um, markets, and all these situations, in fact, we didn't have a free market. There was no free market in the 19th century. Either. It's completely myth uh, that England was operating on the leather share in the 19th century. That a central bank, well, the equivalent of a central bank uh, system, uh, there were all sorts of government regulations. It was freer than any other economy except the U.S. in the 19th century and became the strongest economy in the world because it was relatively free, but not because it wasn't absolutely free. And I actually suggest in this direction what I said that, for example, one example of the mixed economy, you can say, in 19th century publishing was that the government heavily taxed paper. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, Erickson, uh, Lee Erickson, the Fox and Lewis Wolf, made some fascinating arguments uh, uh, where he says, if, when books are expensive, poetry prevails in the market, when books become cheap, fiction prevails. That's really weird, right? But he says, in poetry, every word counts. And if you can read it. And so, if, if you can only own one book in your life, you want it to be a poetry, so you can read it, and read it, and savor it. Um, who wants to read a thousand page fiction novel? So, only when books become cheap could fiction become the center of the market, which books are something now become disposable. Well, you're only going to read a book once, yeah, that fiction is fun. Uh, uh, and he's in terms of the marginal utility 
uh, of a book. It's really it's when we are some property of uh, or whatever that says, it's kind of really, really cool. Uh, and the, the relative cheapness or uh, expansion of the book was related to government intervention in the economy. I haven't even gotten into the issue of labor unions, uh, but that is now. They resisted every advance in technology. The printers unions in England did everything they could uh, to, to uh, prevent uh, line of typing and predicted disasters. Uh, economic disaster uh, with an automatic type setting, of course, what it did was allow the public to live in the storage as ever before, and more people got the jobs in printing than they ever had before. But yes, uh, there, there's in fact always been mixed economy, uh, and I would point uh, in fact to the negative effect uh, uh, to the extent uh, the British economy was not free in the 19th century, it had a negative impact on culture. That's why what I would say to people who advocate government support of the arts, the best support the government could give to the arts would be to get out of the picture and power uh, uh, And that would be such a boost to the economy, would give a boost to, to, to all cultures. And you can actually see uh, ways in which government withdrawal from regulation uh, in 19th century Britain increased uh, the cultural uh, vibrancy of Britain. It, it, it's, a, it, it's a fact that you know, the media often tends to be unregulated because they're one step ahead of the government. Uh, you know, as in the case of the internet, they really you know, don't know how it works. And so, so they, 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 they can't regulate. But as we'll see, you know, we'll talk about this when we get to motion pictures and television, the way government regulation actually has retarded the cultural development uh, of those forms. Yes. Well, it's typical, this is the anti-Walmart argument, uh, that Walmart has too big a position in the market, market and so it affects uh, uh, what and so on. Uh, there's no question that Moody was a maker or breaker. Uh, uh, the big slogan was, what does Moody think in the British publishing uh, industry? But nevertheless, uh, uh, he didn't have a monopoly. He didn't have... He didn't have what an Austin would call a monopoly. He didn't have a government privilege. He was a very shrewd uh, uh, businessman and achieved his market share by legitimately uh, uh, basically through his business as a businessman. Uh, he had a large effect for a long period, but not for all that long. For example, here's a typical example where Austin is not a good uh, but. Moody, you could say, was a problem. Uh, he had too uh, much of a controlling effect on the market. The result was people found ways to produce books cheaper. People started buying books instead of renting them. End the Moody monopoly. End the Moody control of the market. Now, people panic when anyone has a big role in the market. Uh, just look at history, and that role will disappear. You know, you guys all think Bill Gates was his title 20 years. My prediction is, you know, the market will pass him by. The, you know, the government was obsessed with IBM for two decades. Couldn't stop him. Bill Gates took care of him. The market takes care of its own. Uh, but on the matter of Moody, though, I mean, Moody got where he got by reading the market. He was, uh, we would say, puritanical. He was, you know, he was the one, you know, he would say, I don't want sex. In these novels, and you can see the other kind of oh, uh, English fiction would have been like French fiction. It would have been like Saint Anne, but if it hadn't been for Moody, no, Moody was just reading the actual mood of the Victorian public. Well, yeah. Moody had no capability of telling the Victorian, uh, you shouldn't be talking about sex as much as you are, you all. You know, I know you guys want your daughters to be reading sex novels, but I'm going to prevent it. No, it's because 
the public felt that way, and Rudy read the public correctly, that he achieved the position he had in the market. Remove Moody, and he would not have had Stendhal, West Novel, hopefully in England, uh, or Gustav, West Novel, or whatever. Uh, um, this is a good example how, of how the market actually operates. Moody does not have a monopoly. He has a strong position in the market because he's read the market correctly. And in fact, he was certainly an important middleman. He was basically conveying to the publishers what the Victorian market wanted, and the publishers in turn conveyed it uh, to the uh, 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 to the writers. And uh, he performed the exact right role as an entrepreneur, uh, getting the public to uh, uh, get the kind of novel uh, he wanted to read. And again, on that issue, it, it cannot be that no movie and pornography would have flooded the market in Victorian Britain. He was just reading the mood of it. But it's a good question. Uh, I haven't seen someone who's even heard of me. I just doubt that.